Welcome back to the Intro to Orgo series, part two of five. In this section, I will cover the following topics, atomic orbitals, electron configuration, and Lewis dot structure. Recall from part one that when we talked about the position of electron, we simply called their orbitals shells. In this section, we'll go into a lot more detail and understand exactly where every electron is located. But when you learned electron configuration, you looked at the following concepts. You looked at n, l, m sub l, and m sub s, and you define these in terms of where exactly an electron is located. Organic chemistry is simply about understanding. So in this lesson, we will only focus on what you need to understand conceptually rather than learning how to calculate the individuals. Recall from general chemistry that the letter N stands for the principal energy level. And this refers to the horizontal periods as you move from left to right across the periodic table. The other important concept are your actual orbitals, which represent the shapes of where you will find electrons. And the orbitals that we're going to look at are S, P, D, and F. The smallest of the atomic orbitals is your S orbital, which is simply it's circular in shape. As you increase in principal energy level, the size of the S orbital will increase. The next orbital we'll look at is the P orbital. The P orbital looks like a crooked figure eight or an infinity symbol where the center of the P orbital has no electrons. That's where the nucleus is. And the outer wings of the P orbital is where you'll find your electrons. Now, if you recall, there's a PX, PY, and PZ. And this simply has to do with the orientation in space of the specific orbital. When I draw the graph, X is horizontal, Y is vertical. In organic chemistry, when you're showing something in the z-plane, you show a bold line for something coming forward. Just think of it as it's coming out of the page right at you. And then you show dashes to show something fading away or disappearing into the page. The px orbital is going to be in the x-plane. The py orbital will be in the y-plane. The PZ orbital is partly coming out of the page boldly at you and partly disappearing into the page. Now, it doesn't matter which one you designate as your X, Y, or Z orbital. Just understand that there are three P orbitals and they are facing in three different dimensions. The S and P orbitals are the simplest to draw. The D and F orbitals are too complicated, but lucky for you, you don't have to be able to draw these for organic chemistry. So don't worry about it. We know the concept, now let's apply it in theory. Principal energy level refers to the horizontal periods. So here we have one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven. Now don't forget that these two series over here fit in right over here. So this is actually six and seven in principal energy level. Now let's look at the actual orbitals. The first orbital, your S orbital, is the block all the way to the left. Recall that your s orbital can hold a total of two electrons, and that's represented by group number one and group number two. Remember that helium, even though it shows up all the way on the right, is actually part of your s orbital because it only has two electrons. Now let's move over to the right and look at the p orbital. Recall that the p orbital can hold a total of six electrons, two each for your px, PY, and PZ orbitals. These here are found in groups number 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. The next block is your D block and consists of most of your transition metals. Now recall that the D orbital has 5 suborbitals, which gives you a total of 10 electrons, represented here as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. What's important to note about your d orbitals is that even though it appears to start at principal energy level number 4, it actually begins at principal energy level number 3. So this is 3, 4, 5, and 6. And later you'll have to pay attention here when you're assigning electron configuration. And finally we have our f orbitals down here which composes your lanthanide and actinide series. And as we said before, these rarely show up in organic chemistry. Recall, however, that your f orbital has a total of seven suborbitals for a total of 14 electrons. 
The electron configuration tells you that every electron in an atom essentially has its own address. This address refers to the principal energy level, the orbital and suborbital will you find the electron. The examples we look at will all deal with ground state electrons and not atoms in the excited state or ions which will be looked at in a later video. Three quick rules before we continue. The first of these is the Aufbau principle. And Aufbau literally means to build up. When you're assigning electron configurations, you start with the lowest possible electron position and then you slowly work your way upwards. So you won't assign an electron a 2s1 orbital if the 1s is still empty. The next rule we'll look at is Hund's rule. What Hund's rule tells us is that when you have multiple suborbitals, for example, we'll look at the px, py, and pz. You can put up to six electrons into the p orbital, but the order that you put them matters. Well, if I have five electrons to fill in, I won't put two within px while py and z are open, but instead I will put one into px, one in py, one in pz, and then come back to px and py and fill in the remaining two electrons. The final rule is the Pauli exclusion principle. And what this tells us is that no two electrons can ever occupy the same exact address. If two electrons are in the same s orbital, one will be the upspin, or let's say s1, and the other will be the downspin. Every part of the address has, can be the same as long as there is one difference. Recall that in a neutral atom, the number of protons equal the number of electrons. So we can use the periodic table and follow the atomic number when counting the electron number in order to find the electron configuration of an atom. Knowing information isn't enough to understand it. Now you actually have to apply it in practice. So let's look at a few examples. Say I asked you for the address of the electrons within an atom. You simply have to follow the table and see what you pass along the way. Let's use hydrogen as our first example. Notice that the principal energy level is 1 and the orbital is s. We have one electron which gives me a 1s1 configuration. Notice that for boron I first have to pass 1s1 and 1s2 and then I continue on to 2s1 and 2s2 and finally I have 2p1. This tells me that the configuration for boron is 1s2, 2s2, 2p1. Now let's look at bromine, a much more complicated example. For bromine, I have 1s1, 1s2, 2s1, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, then I have 4s1, 4s2, now here's where you need to be careful. Here I have 3D and not 4D, so I have 3D10. And finally, I have 4P1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now what if I asked you to find something like iodine or francium? These atoms, because they have so many electrons, will take way too long to write. So there is a very useful shortcut that we can apply. But before we do that, let's talk about a simple theory. If I tell you to look for the electron configuration of something like helium, helium is really the same electron configuration as hydrogen plus one electron. What if I ask you for something like sulfur? Sulfur is really just phosphorus plus one electron. Using this information, I can define the electronic configuration of one atom by finding another atom and seeing how many electrons it has and then simply adding the difference. The reason this is useful is now I can go back to my iodine example and see that iodine comes after the noble gas krypton. So I can write krypton in brackets. After krypton, I simply have 5s2. I have 4d10 and then I have 5p5. We can now do the same thing for francium. 
Notice that francium comes after the noble gas radon, so I will put that in brackets. And after radon, I simply have 7s1. Now isn't that so much easier? Using a noble gas configuration in brackets tells me that the kernel, meaning everything that is under the valence shell, that includes the nucleus and all non-valence electrons are located in those brackets and then out of that I simply have to write the valence electrons. All of this is contained within the kernel and out of the kernel I simply have the valence shell electrons. This once again reiterates the point that because chemistry is mostly about valence electrons I don't want to waste time writing out everything found in the kernel but instead I go straight to what's important so I can go right to my reactions. Let's try a few more examples. For an atom like magnesium, now I simply find the noble gas in the previous row, which is neon, and I put neon in brackets, followed by 3s2. For something like chlorine, once again I start with neon, but in this case I have 3s2 and 3p5. Now notice that 3s2 are the only valence electrons for magnesium, and 3s2, 3p5 are the valence electrons for chlorine. And this leads into the final topic of this video, the Lewis dot structure. The Lewis dot structure is a simplified way of showing the valence electrons on a specific atom. So let's take a look at an example. If I want to look at a hydrogen atom, well that's very simple. Hydrogen has just one electron, so I'm going to draw it arbitrarily on the right. Let's look at nitrogen. Notice that the valence shell of nitrogen is going to have 2s2, or just S2, we don't really care that it's number 2. So we're going to draw those two electrons together because remember S fills before you go into the next shell. Then we have our P orbital which fills one at a time so we just show one electron on each side. Different texts will show you the Lewis dot structure may be shown with the two electrons on top or two electrons on a different side. Now, this is not as important because recall that an atom is rotating freely in space so if I show the 2s on this side or show the 2s on top, it ultimately doesn't matter. Notice that magnesium only has two electrons in its s orbital, so we put two electrons together. Now let's look at chlorine, which has seven valence electrons. We have two electrons in the s orbital, and then we have five in the p orbital. So we first fill them one at a time, one, two, three, and then we start doubling up four and five. Now if you have a good understanding of everything we said up until now, you can simply look at the periodic table and determine the Lewis dot structure without having to think about all the S and P electrons and any other electrons located in the kernel. So I can take a look at oxygen and tell you right away, I have 2S and I have 4P. So oxygen is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Same thing with sulfur. If I look at chlorine, I simply add one more electron to that. Argon, even more. So let's look at argon. Notice that we have one, two, and then we have one, two, three, four, five, six. I hope you enjoyed this video, and be sure to see all five Intro to Orgo videos to ensure that when you start studying organic chemistry, you have a thorough understanding of the chemistry required to be able to ace the material. If you have any questions, I will be happy to help you with them. Simply post your questions in the comments below or send me an email and I will respond as soon as I can. Email your questions to tutorials at leahforsci.com. You can find additional study information and more tutorials on my website at www.leah, spelled L-E-A-H, the number four, S-C-I, dot and you can also find me right here on my YouTube channel, Leia for Sci Tutorials.